All right, and we are live. Um, I want to say welcome to Sister Reach Monthly Social Justice Preacher Series. I'm Elise Salisbury, Deputy Director at Sister Reach. Sister Reach is a 501c3 grassroots nonprofit organization founded by Sheree Scott in 2011 in Memphis, Tennessee. This year, we are celebrating um, our 10-year anniversary. Sister Reach supports the reproductive autonomy of women and teens of color, poor and rural women, LGBTQ plus people and our families through the framework of reproductive justice. Sister Reach's mission is to empower our base to lead healthy lives, raise healthy families and live, live in healthy and sustainable communities. This is achieved through working by a four-pronged strategy, which is education, policy and advocacy, cultural shift and harm reduction on local, national, and international levels. This month's preacher series special guest orator is Dr. Sylvia Rue. Dr. Rue is a writer, filmmaker, activist, and producer. A native Southern Californian, she received a master's degree from UCLA and went on to the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco, and is the first African-American to uh, 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 to receive a doctorate degree in human sexuality. She has worked as a psychiatric social worker at ML uh, King Hospital, as assistant director of counseling services at the LA Gay and Lesbian Community Center, as director of religious affairs with the National Black Justice Coalition, and was the California state leader on marriage equality as a coalition manager of the California Freedom to Marry Coalition. And those are just a few of the amazing things to mention from an amazing resume and experience that Dr. Rue brings. Please help me welcome Dr. Sylvia Rue as our Social Justice Preacher Series Preacher of the Month of September. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Elise, and thank Rich for inviting me to speak again. Uh, today's topic is holiness and sexual health education. So I'd like to begin by saying that it was God who gave us the gift of sex and sexuality. Every single part of the human body, the, the bones, the brains, the minds, our eyes, our muscles, our organs, our skin, and our genitals are part of God's plan for the expression and existence of life. Jesus said, I come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. An abundant life includes a healthy sexuality, and sexuality is holy. We need our churches involved in sexual health education. It is imperative because healthy, successful churches need to have adults who are knowledgeable about human sexuality, who are comfortable about talking about human sexuality, and have people who are sex positive and can talk to youth and young people about sex in a way that gives them accurate information and tools to navigate their sexual and emotional lives. Too often religious systems, especially in Western society, have separated sex from the sacred. Traditional religious systems seem to be uncomfortable with the area between your navel and your knees. That's the term Bishop Flunder likes to say when she's trying to make a point about sexuality. And she'll say, every part of me is good. And I'd like to say, every part of you is good. You know, it's not like God was creating humans and was about to get to the area between the navel and the knees and took a coffee break and then Satan rushed in and put in genitals. That's just not how it works. In fact, our sexual organs are some of the highest thoughts of a God who loves us. We have a sacred erotic core. It's an indelible part of our humanity. So the church can provide and should provide quality sexual health education if it chooses to do. But too often, church leadership instead chooses to ignore sex education, sexual reality, and sometimes refuses to be involved in providing accurate sex information. I spent years working with these churches and I know what resistance looks like. And I'm gonna give you some examples of how not to be a sex positive, sex affirming church. 
I attended uh, the Black Seventh-day Adventist College in Alabama, Elkwood College in the 60s. And the sex uh, education there was basically, well, you're never gonna have sex until you get married. And when you get married, you're gonna have sex. Well, so why even, why even bother with it? Why even discuss it? So uh, when I got to Oakwood, of course, that was the attitude. And we had worship at 7 and 15 in the morning and 6, 15 in the afternoon, uh, every day during the week. And one day, our dean told us we were going to have um, a special worship and no man could be allowed. And they're gonna, we're going to talk about something that begins with an S and affects all of us. And I said, finally, they're going to talk about sex. So when that day came, I, I wanted to hear what she had to say. And she said, she repeated, we're going to talk about something that affects all of us. It begins with S and you know what that is. That's right, sleep. And that was the entirety of the sex education that I got from uh, <laughs> Oakwood College and the Adventist Church. In fact, the founder of the Adventist Church, Ellen G. White, believed that masturbation would lead to quote, numerous pains in the system and various diseases such as affliction of the liver and lungs, neuralgia, rheumatism, affliction of the spine, disease, kidneys, and cancerous humor, humors. And the Mormon church uh, has a pamphlet called Steps to Overcoming Masturbation. And they recommend young men tie their hands to the bed to prevent them from masturbating. The Catholic church still admonishes nuns not to masturbate because of potential forbidden fantasies. Uh, this is not healthy sex education. A, set, a healthy sex education program would rejoice in the wonders of sex. Uh, there was a speech that uh, former President Jimmy Carter gave to the Parliament of World Religions. And it was about how male leaders approach women and their authority, the authority they choose to tell women what to do and how to think. And he said, uh, Jimmy Carter said, I quote, the truth is that male religious leaders have had and still have an option to interpret holy teachings either to exalt or subjugate women. They have for their own selfish ends overwhelmingly chose the latter. The justification of discrimination against women and girls on grounds of religion or tradition as if it were prescribed by a higher authority is unacceptable, end quote. Too often religious leaders want to deny or suppress the fact that sex and sexual expression are just core functions of humanity. For too long, sex and sexuality, orgasm and pleasure have been demoted from the spiritual, spiritual realm to that which is considered lower and base. And to counter this notion, I posited a new definition of orgasm that brings spirituality into the equation because sex and spirituality are mutually synergistic, synergistic or energies that should feed and nourish each other. They should not be at odds with each other. So my definition is that orgasm is the kiss of God that brings ecstasy to consciousness in a grand and grateful moment of earthly abandon. What we know is that sexuality and sexual orientation are gifts from a creator that allows humans to express the mysteries of their sacred erotic core in ways that can lead to a fuller experience of one's humanity. So I'm gonna talk a minute about what's going on right now. Have, has anyone heard of a man named Jonathan Mitchell? You'll probably hear that name again. He's the man, he's the lawyer behind the draconian Texas abortion ban. What if he had had a sex education? that taught him that sex was holy and good and a source of joy because the ban went through in Texas and now women are getting in their cars and driving 500 miles to another state and hoping to get back before their husband knows exactly where they went or trying to get away from work. And they're, they're just, they feel trapped. Uh, this is a quote, it was the deeply religious Mitchell who advised Texas lawmakers to, to devise their anti-abortion law with a legal loophole, essentially giving lawsuits to ordinary, ordinary people rather than to state officials. 
Mitchell said that people should stop complaining about the Texas law he designed to restrict abortion because if women don't wanna worry about needing an abortion, they can just stop having sex. He, uh, the ultimate goal is to go after the sodomy laws and gay rights, uh, gay marriage laws and uh, birth control laws. In fact, Texas now is trying to restrict uh, the morning after pill to women in Texas. But it's because of men and women who think like him, abortion care has never been at greater risk during our lifetimes than it is right now. We need to team up with people and organizations to fight like hell for reproductive justice and affirm the necessity and holiness of sexual education. <clears throat> Haley Selassie said, uh, I'm not there yet. I'm gonna give you a biblical perspective on reproductive justice. Now, uh, another name you should know is John Pavlovitz. He's a Unitarian minister who writes, writes uh, a blog every week. And he's just been, he's just uh, so articulate and uh, amazing. In fact, unfortunately, he's, he has a brain tumor and is, uh, he's gonna have to go into surgery. And so we're praying for his health. But he wrote, uh, he wrote a very uh, brilliant pr pr uh, biblical perspective on reproductive justice that says God is pro-choice. And if you allow me, I, I couldn't, I couldn't pare this down enough because what he's, every word was so brilliant. And I'm so I'm gonna read what he wrote. He said, this shouldn't even be a conversation. The idea that America is here at this place and time in our planet's history, still debating whether or not women should have autonomy over their own bodies shows we aren't maturing or progressing or evolving as a nation. It also shows that millions of people of faith here are defiantly defying God's primary will. Christians of all people should be unequivocal in moments like this, God is pro-choice. And we know God is pro-choice because the Bible tells us so. If you believe God exists, and if you believe the Christian scriptures to be your primary guide in understanding the character of God, you'll find out that pretty early on, free will is kind of a big deal. The opening chapters of the book of Genesis describe in poetic language, God speaking all creation into being, fashioning out of dark and formless chaos, every radiant bit of this planet and its inhabitants, all the light, shape, and color of the disparate beauty here. Whether you're a believer or not, you likely know the Genesis story. Six days of grand artistry, six days of spectacular displays of creative power, a boatload of animals, two people, and a seventh day of rest, followed by one tree, one piece of fruit, one serpent, and the mess that follows. The heart of the creation narrative is God giving human beings the right to determine their own path. They are divinely endowed with self-determination. They are co-creators of their own stories. They are not mindless robots or blind syncophants. They get to choose because God wants them to choose. God doesn't choose for them and other people don't choose for them. And the government doesn't choose for them. Anything else is a form of slavery and God emancipates people from all kinds of captivity. The book of Genesis presents the maker of all things as creating every member of humankind inherently good, specifically original, and able and qualified to decide who they are and what they do and how they live and move and breathe through this life. For professed Christians, it is antithetical to that God's intentions to attempt to legislatively control a woman's body because the higher law said that she is in control of it, period. There's no biblical precedent or scriptural justification for a person of faith to partner in any human made law that supersedes the free will of a woman. He's almost three, he, this, he says, this isn't about abortion. This is, it isn't about the semantics of pro-life or pro-birth or anti-abortion labels. This isn't about the minutia of when you believe life begins. These are diversions from the central issue at hand for professed Christians. This shouldn't be about debating 
anything but whether or not women should be allowed to have what God has already given them choice. And for any supposed believer who claims the Bible to direct them, arguing against the woman's right to choose is arguing, <clears throat> arguing against the very heart of God as depicted in the scriptures. He says, I'm a Christian man and I'm pro-life in the sense that I am pro the lives of women, women having autonomy over their own bodies. Beyond that, I yield to what they do with that autonomy, um, autonomy because I nor anyone else should have jurisdiction there. Christian, you're entitled to believe that life is sacred. I certainly do. But you're not entitled by any scripture passage or any biblical mandate to legislatively force your will upon another human being, no matter what justification you make for it. So we cannot let, uh, that's, that's, thank you, John Pavlitz for that. Oh, uh, we can't let our wombs be wards of the state like they were when I was young. And I saw firsthand the damage and destruction of women's lives because everything we fought for and won is on the line. Haley Selassie said, throughout history it has been the inaction of those who could have acted, the indifference of those who should have known better, the silence of the voice of justice when it mattered most that has made it possible for evil to triumph. But the good news is we have many allies who are reinvigorated to fight for reproductive justice, sexual health education, and clergy of all faiths who stand with us to help us access sex education. Because as the wise and spiritually, spiritually developed know in their wisdom, that sexual health education is holy. You know, in the 1960s, Martin Luther King said, the churches should be the headlight and not the tail light. So let's work to get more churches involved in this work and bring sexuality back to its natural sacredness. Thank you. Awesome, Dr. Ruth, thank you so much. Ooh, you, you, listen, you, as always, you said, a, you said a lot that, you know, that basically um, it was the total sum of the battle, right? That we're in the midst of, and it all goes back to um, our ability um, to respect choice, right? Yep. We all have a choice. Right. Yeah, so it goes back to that. So, so my question, my first question is, you mentioned um, uh, that someone's response to masturbation, right? Um, that it would leave you with numerous pains up to cancerous tumors. Yes. Why do you believe the church chooses fear over sex positivity? Well, and we know that 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 folks in the church are having sex because the babies keep coming. Everyone knows that. <laughs> For the most part, you know, some don't result in 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 um in babies, but you know, we know that sex is you know got created to for us to enjoy. So why again do do you believe that churches choose to demonize it over uh being sex positive? Uh they can read certain parts of the Bible that could be interpreted as the Bible being sex negative, but we can also read many parts of the Bible, including Song of Solomon, that show that the Bible is sex positive. But it's like Jimmy Carter said, that's why I brought it up. They choose to approach these situations in certain ways. Uh, I was, uh, like I said, I've been working with these churches for like 30 years, and but it, that means the religious right too. So Pat Robertson's Christian Coalition had a conference, uh, Road to Victory in Washington, DC, and I went. And when I walked in, they were so surprised to see a black person, they forgot to charge me the fee. And I went, <laughs> I went to a workshop on sexuality because I wanted to know what, what are you people thinking? And because the Christian coalition works so much against LGBT rights, I wanted to see, you know, what, what are you guys talking about? What I realized from their response that someone had a line drawing of a semi-erect penis and the woman almost had a heart attack. And I said, these people cannot deal with sexuality. It's not homosexuality that trips them out. It's sexually their own sexuality. One thing is that orgasm means you're out of control for a minute and they want to be, and they can't, they have no control over it. Also sexual desires, they feel they have no control over. 
So they want to project that onto other people and say, you're bad. This is what you're thinking. This what, and I, you know, there, there's a big list of, uh, of Christian Republican anti-gay people who are um, caught with boys, you know, and it's just the hypocrisy. In fact, every time you have one of these Republican conferences, go to Grindr and Tinder and see how many people are trying. They see that as a hookup. Everyone, <laughs> most people know that. It's just their hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy because they can't deal with their own sexuality because it makes them think things they feel are bad. And they, they haven't had good, healthy sex education. Agreed, agreed, absolutely agreed. Um, and so I was reading um, probably about a month ago that it used to be in the Northeastern part of the United States where viewership of pornography was highest but over the past couple of years it's moved down here to the bible the south, the south the bible. which absolutely supports right what yeah. you, the statement you just yeah, made they're, around they're, they're sex obsessed and don't want to be sex obsessed and they get mad they project what they think is badness out to other people and they want to legislate against it absolutely absolutely especially in the red states <laughs> so yes. So I also it also has the, it has the highest numbers of uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Absolutely. And yes. pregnancy, unwanted pregnancies. Mm -hmm. All the things that could be taken care of if you had healthy sex education, mm -hmm. that you could deal with these things. Absolutely. In Colorado, they let um, uh, abortion is down because people get access to free birth control. Mm -hmm. and But it, you're not going to get that in Texas. They don't want you even to get mail order the day after pills. Right, and I heard you say that um, it was something about, um, um, they were attempting to restrict the morning after pill in Texas? That's, that's the newest thing, yeah, in Texas. The governor wants to restrict that. Do you know his logic? Did you, did you uh, read his uh, logic? Well, his that? real logic is he hates women and doesn't understand anything about them. <laughs> wants them, he wants the hammer to come down on them. And another thing is they don't feel there's enough white babies being born. They, you know, Absolutely. They replacement theory. If we let these white women have abortions, then, the, then we're going to be taken over by the brown and black and yellow people. And we can't mm -hmm. let that happen. So we have to put the hammer down on them. Absolutely. Um, we were in a conversation uh, the other day and someone mentioned um, that SB8, right, is really about um, the, you know, white women in that state who have stopped, uh, who have, who have chosen to, to not to birth, right? Right. And so, you know, attempting to overturn uh, Roe versus Wade, like this is, this is what they're attempting. So the very thing that you just mentioned can happen. Right? Yeah. But I, I absolutely agree that it's not about uh, being pro-life because I was having a conversation um, with a lady that I saw standing outside of a uh, healthcare facility. And I asked her, I said, so you drove, I said, you and your friends outside of this gate. I said, you drove through several food deserts just to come here and stand up with signs, why? You know, and so, you know, I explained to her the same thing that you said, that it's not so much as that they're pro-life, they're pro-birth. And when someone chooses to birth or when someone births, like they're left, these same people, right? Leave them on their own. And so absolutely agree, absolutely agree. But again, I, I don't think um, I asked you for this, but a, a second ago, it was on my mind, but your definition, your definition that you mentioned of orgasm, can you, can you give us that definition one more time? Because I thought it was great. Uh, orgasm is the kiss of God that brings ecstasy to consciousness in a grand and grateful moment of earthly abandon. Wow. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for that. I, wanna, I wanted to make sure we captured that because it gives so much more of uh, uh, positive language, right? You know, to, to our limited or our ability to not really explain what orgasm is. Yeah. But that was great. 
Thank but you. also because I wanted to bring God into what God created. Yes, absolutely. As opposed to you had that, I mean, <laughs> orgasm is a wonderful thing. And it's, it's, it is a gift from God. And yes. humans are, are orgasm seekers. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Because, you know, to be sex positive, you know, I guess in a way, pa paraphrasing um, uh, the definition, is to know God, right? To be sick, the, the, or, the, the orgasm experience, right, is another way of getting to know our creator. Right. And there's nothing negative about that. And sometimes it makes us cry out, oh God. I <laughs> <laughs> that, cry that often, you know. Just, right, oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Just bringing God into it, yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> As always, Dr. Ruth, you know, I love your theology. I love the work that you've done. Um, I love this conversation that, that we're having. I don't see any questions in the um, in the comment section. Mm -hmm. I know um, those who will watch this um, later, who are able to watch it later, will enjoy it as much as we did. Thank you, as always, for your time. If there are any questions that, that anyone has, you can leave them here and uh, I'll be sure to get them uh, from, Dr. Oh, get them to Dr. Ru, I'm sorry. So again, I'm Dr. Ru, thank you. Answer. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I'll get those questions to you uh, if there be any. We always appreciate your time, your wisdom, your experience, your amazing work that you bring, your writing, all that you bring to these uh, series and conversations that we have. Um, again, thank those who are, thank you to those who are viewing this um, now and those who will view it later, right? Um, uh, we'll see you next month um, for the month of October Preacher Series. Uh, until then, thank you again for your time and attention and your support of Sister Reach. Uh, you all have a great day. Okay. Bye bye. Hold on one second. Let me make sure. Uh, all right.